Thank you. Um, well, it's it's very lovely to be here, and um, I only wish it was in person, but thank you very much to Jason and to Sibylla for inviting me. Uh, and I'm talking today about something, it's very odd, I've never really given a talk about research that uh, is now some years old, um, because the, the book that I published came out in 2018, and, I, and, and so this feels, in a sense, um, like a, a sort of nice kind of revisiting, a nice... Um, uh, uh, return for me uh, to something that I hadn't thought too much about for a while, but I've returned to with fresh eyes, as it were, um, in 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 recent months. Um, and I'm going to be talking uh, a little bit about a very particular reception of Blake in the middle of the 20th century in America. Um, and when I get to the focus of it, particularly about Robert Duncan's um, reception of Blake and the particular idea of what it means to write from myth, the political, the difficulties when a kind of political imperative come together with a mythopoeic imagination. Um, so that is, uh, in a sense, what the, the talk is going to be largely about. Um, but in order uh, to get there, really, uh, I wanted just to to set a little bit of um, the scene of Blake's mid 20th century reception. I know we're going to be hearing much more about this on Friday. There are a couple of panels um, specifically devoted to counterculture and another one to America, where I think uh, we're, we're going to, to hear more about this. Um, but uh, this book, The Making of a Counterculture, which was the book that coined the term counterculture, um, Theodore Rotsack's book came out in 1968. And when Rotsack coined this term, he chose as an epigraph these lines from Blake's um, Milton. Rouse up, O young men of the new age, set your foreheads against the ignorant hirelings. For we have hirelings in the camp, the court and the university who would, if they could, forever depress and prolong corporal war. And the citation, I'm sure, is familiar to this audience. Um, uh, and it is, of course, from the preface to Blake's long poem, and it precedes the hymn of Jerusalem. Um, it set an apocalyptic tone for what Rotsack wanted to present as a revolution in consciousness. It celebrated in this context the idea of youth, of creative imagination. It turned against the commercialization of art. And Rotsack claimed that God was present in these young men of the new age, the countercultural youth to his imagination, who offered some redemption from what he saw um, as a technocracy that was starting to dominate contemporary society. Um, and he, he oriented his argument against the hegemony of a rationalistic, a scientific worldview, and he celebrated um, irrational faculties, imaginative mental faculties. So for WhatsApp, this counterculture stemmed from what he called, again, quoting from Blake, a dissenting sensibility as old as the laments that the romantic poets had once raised against the dark satanic mills. Um, and there's another familiar allusion here, uh, this time to the building of the New Jerusalem, right? the building of um, uh, in, in Rotsack's imagination, this becomes part of one of the central myths of colonial America, which is the building of a new Eden. Um, so Rotsack's uh, Blake becomes a champion of imagination over reason, of freedom over tyranny, of youth over age. And he exemplified a faith in imagination rather than politics as the real force of social revolution. So this is a generation um, which has been wanting to make this claim for a long time. So the thing to remember about 1968 is that while we tend to think of it, um, because it was in a way this great moment of revolutionary energy of youth culture, it was also, I think, the last cry of a generation who kind of knew they were on their way out. A lot of the people who had become figureheads for this generation, literary people as well, people like Allen Ginsberg, had been saying this kind of stuff for about 20 years by this point. Um, and, you know, despite them saying it, America and American politics, and particularly international politics, had developed in such a way that made them feel increasingly 
desperate, really, increasingly um, polarised, increasingly uh, as if this was a sort of last ditch cry. Um, so this was a generation in which left wing American radicals, and it is a particularly kind of broadly speaking left wing movement, could identify America itself as satanic in its imperialism, its capitalism, its racism, and its war in Vietnam. But they could also feel America to be vibrantly alive with the radicalism of the arts and theology. And Blake spoke particularly to this mood. He was received um, in this mood. And it was partly through his association with the 19th century American poet Walt Whitman, uh, that he became known also as a poet of sexual liberation um, and gay poets like Allen Ginsberg and Robert Duncan featured here um, on the left and the right respectively found him inspiring for this way. He became uh, a poet of sexual openness, a spiritual leader um, and he was quite broadly respected. It was a, a kind of broad church in a way, even though it was a very particular brand of, of, of Blakeanism. And he was respected by soul-searching Christians, antinomians, Jews, Buddhists, um, whose various forms of religiosity shaped their visions of what America could be or become. So in some ways, it was the kind of adaptability of Blake, um, the way in which he could speak in so many different ways, I think that accounted for his popularity. Um, that said, there was a very particular Blake that was received and the literary Blakeanism um, that developed in mid 20th century America was intrinsically connected to popular elements of counterculture, of sexual freedom, of questing religiosity and of drug taking. Um, and it was these lines really from the marriage of heaven and hell, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite, that resonated through the counterculture as a, as a sort of mantra. Um, and Blake could easily have been reduced to a few memorable and quotable lines. I think it's partly these the crystalline quality in a way of um, these lines from the marriage of heaven and hell that, that allowed them to have this uh, to, to, to have this, this mantra-like quality, that they, aphorism and mantra, share a similar kind of poetic texture. Um, and, you know, he, he could have been uh, reduced to lines that became, for want of a better word, cliche in the Calvin culture, cliche um, relating to liberty, uh, cliche relating to freedom, cliche relating to a kind of youthful and often unthinking optimism. And the complexity of his thought could well have been lost um, in this cry to open the doors of perception. But I think um, that this wasn't the case, and it wasn't the case in popular counterculture, and it wasn't the case in his literary reception. Um, and his literary reception, which is the bit that I, I sort of know more about um, in mid 20th century America, while in some ways inextricable, I think, from these popularised sentiments, articulated ideas that were quite careful, quite nuanced, um, more qualified and often more troubling than those uh, allowed by this kind of mantra of cleansed perception. And perhaps the most high profile countercultural Blakeanism was Allen Ginsberg. Um, and I know that we're again going to hear more about him in the course of this, this conference and his self fashioning. But Ginsberg really took Blake as a prophetic guru. Um, and Blake became incredibly important to Ginsberg's self fashioning as a modern day prophet during the 50s and 60s. Um, and Ginsberg repeatedly uh, recalled during these years an experience that he had in Harlem in 1948. He said, I was in my bed, this is um, in 1966, he's still talking about this, I was in my bed in Harlem jacking off and just after I came on this occasion with a Blake book in my lap, I wasn't even reading, my eye was idling over the page of Our Sunflower and it suddenly appeared, the poem I'd read lots of times before, over familiar to the point where it didn't make any particular meaning 
except some sweet thing about flowers. And suddenly I realised the poem was talking about me. And suddenly, simultaneously with understanding it, heard a very deep, earthen, grave voice in the room. And I immediately assumed, I didn't think twice, was Blake's voice. So you can see, um, and again, I know we're going to hear more about this, I think a whole paper on this, so I don't want to tread on those toes, but you can see the way that Ginsberg uh, is shaping his own self-image here, um, is performing a kind of nonchalance for it, performing a kind of mode of inspiration. Um, and he remembered it, uh, he shaped it very self-consciously as a prophetic uh, calling. He said that my eye on the page, simultaneously the auditory hallucination or whatever terminology he had used, the apparitional voice in the room, woke me further deep in my understanding of the poem because the voice was so completely tender and beautiful, ancient. And simultaneous to that voice, there was also an emotion risen in my soul in response to the voice and a sudden visual realisation of the same awesome phenomena. Suddenly it seemed that I saw into the depths of the universe by looking simply into the ancient sky. Anyway, my first thought was that this was what I was born for. And my second thought, never forget, never renege, never deny, never deny the voice, no, never forget it. Don't get lost wandering in spirit, other spirit worlds or American or job worlds or advertising worlds or worlds or earth world, but the spirit of the universe was what I was born to realise. Okay, so vision follows from voice in this recollection, and Ginsberg is very specifically situating himself in a tradition of prophetic bards. And he experiences, he, he presents his experience of an auditory hallucination as a manifestation of his own destiny, his own prophetic responsibility. And it becomes an act of social responsibility. And this, I think, is the particular situation of the prophet artist that Blake comes to inspire. Uh, the voice of one crying in a wilderness, but also the most over-responsible, uber-responsible person in society, right, who is called to speak the truth. And the important thing here, I think, for Ginsberg is this sense of lineage, this sense of stretching back a connectedness back through time that comes to make the moment of inspiration mean everything it has ever meant and everything it will mean, right? And that's the prophetic mode, the po poetic mode that he is he is challenging here. Um, and he says the presumption was part prophecy, part Blakean inspiration, part ordinary mind from Whitman. Again, you know, an important Whitman is an important link in this chain. That is to say, the poet who speaks from his frank heart in public, speaks for all hearts, right? A very, very Whitman-esque formulation of poetic responsibility here. The individual self which can ventriloquize the voice of um, the nation or even something more universal and, and uh, uh, in, in, inclusive than that. Um, uh, and this, I think, in some ways, you know, speaks uh, very directly to what Jason was saying in, in his introductory notes to this conference about the idea of global Blake, um, resisting the englobing that becomes such a damning thing in Blake's verse and turning on that kind of boundary, um, that tension to want to express something which is expansive and broader. Um, but of course, but for Ginsberg, as for Blake, that was difficult to do. And I think a lot of my talk today is going to be about how difficult that is to do, um, even when it is well meant. And Ginsberg's embrace of Blake um, as part of his own relentless, and it did become relentless, I think, self-fashioning, stumbled on an idea, uh, a fear that he might become tied to an idea of Blake that was stale and a performance that was inauthentic and constant, consequently constricting, englobing, a form, you know, his adoption of Blake is always searching for a form that feels free from received error, but he, he, he you know, he worries 
but actually he's becoming repetitive, that he's becoming tied. And he describes a feeling of renunciation he had uh, while traveling in Japan in 1962. He says, there was a cycle that began with the Blake vision, which ended on a train in Kyoto. When I realized that to attain the depth of consciousness that I was seeking when I was talking about the Blake vision, and he's been talking a lot about the Blake vision, um, that in order to attain it, I had to cut myself off from the Blake vision and renounce it. A markedly changed and much more politically committed Ginsberg ended up reading Blake outside the Chicago Democratic Convention in 1968, where he stood amongst the crowds um, to protest against America's war in Vietnam. My talk today isn't going to be about Ginsburg. I was using Ginsburg um, <laughs> shamelessly as, as a little bit of a setup here, but it's going to be about one of his close friends, his poetic associates, Robert Duncan. And Duncan was an equally avid, um, though perhaps less well-known, um, Blakeian. I, I don't know how well-known he is to people here, but I suspect slightly less so than Ginsburg. But when in 1954, Ginsburg had first traveled to San Francisco and united the countercultures that were developing on the east and west coasts of America, he met Duncan. Um, and Duncan, together with his partner, Jess, who's featured here in the top uh, left of the screen, renovated the six, six gallery prior to the first performance of Howe. Um, and you can see the, the six gallery uh, as a gallery um, on the right there. Um, Duncan drew from and contributed to the tradition that uh, we can see in Ginsburg um, of reading Blake as relevant not only to a sort of personal quest and personal identity, but as relevant to America's literary self-image as a mythic and prophetic nation. But he also took that self-fashioning in really important and I think quite distinctly different um, directions. Uh, what Duncan did, I think more than, than anyone really, is recognize the violence um, that is inherent in Blake's visions of America and particularly in his works uh, with, with a great American theme, uh, Visions of the Daughters of Albion and America of Prophecy. Um, and he brought the, the, the relationship between revelation, um, the, the mythopoesis of revelation, of spiritual and mythic and poetic revelation, and revolution, both in terms of a revolution in consciousness, the psychedelic revolution that had been kind of going on and being played out for about 20 years, um, and political revolution that was becoming ever more present, really, um, the idea of marching uh, against, um, against Vietnam. Um, and he brought those two things into tension with each other. Um, and Duncan was always resistant, very resistant to the idea of writing politically committed poetry. Uh, he said, and I, I'm, I'm remembering here, this isn't, I'm afraid, on my handout, um, uh, but uh, he, he remember uh, he, he said at one point, um, uh, you know, if I want to protest, I march. I march at the same level that hundreds of people march. But if I want to write a poem, that's something else. Right? That's not what a poem does. And yet, having said that, there is clearly a sense of political engagement, of a broader meaning to what political poetry can be in his poetry and particularly in the way in which he received Blake and he recalled that as a young man he would return again to Milton and to Blake searching out there a vision of the individual freedom and the communal commitment of man right so what I think is he wanted poetry to provide an alternative form of democratic participation um, a form which would recover the meaning of freedom from uh, the increasingly toxic lexicon of American foreign policy. And Duncan, um, like many of his poetic contemporaries, was appalled by his country's war in Vietnam. And he believed that it was symptomatic of a greater sickness in American democracy. Um, so this is how he starts to think about uh, marches and contemporary political events in relation to um, 
mythopoesis and his vision of poetry. Duncan was raised by theosophists um, and he, his adopted parents, he was adopted at a young age, and his adopted parents were followers of Madame Blavatsky, um, like Yeats, and in fact he uh, came to Blake through the Yeats Ellis edition. Um, and he was brought up uh, to, to expect, he was taught to expect, an imminent fiery apocalypse that would complete the story of the flood. Um, and so he came naturally to a vocabulary of correspondence, where everything in the physical world and the political world um, had an often terrifying spiritual meaning. Um, his parents were not only followers of uh, Madame Blavatsky, who um, was uh, launched the Theosophical Movement, again, something which I expect this audience, a lot, a lot of members in this audience know something about. Um, they were also avid readers of Swedenborg, um, and they were devotees of the occult. Duncan explained their faith. He said, for my parents, the truth of things was esoteric locked inside, or occult, masked by the apparent, and one needed a lost key in order to piece together, piece out the cryptogram of who wrote Shakespeare or who created the universe and what his real message was. From the theosophy of the 1890s, my maternal grandmother had passed from spiritualism to become an elder in a hermetic brotherhood, similar to and contemporaneous with the Order of the Golden Dawn to which Yeats belonged. Not only stories and books, but dreams and life itself were to be read in terms of contained and revealed messages, even as in our time works of art, dreams and daily life are read by devotees of psychoanalysis, or as the people of the book, Jews and Christians and Muslims, have always read God's intent in the world, in history, and whatever written record. For theosophists, psychoanalysts and the converts of revealed religion, it is not the story that is primary, but the meaning behind the story. So Duncan was influenced by um, the Yeats Ellis edition of Blake, and he was conditioned by his occultist upbringing. Um, and so he came to read Blake as a prophet who addressed the concerns of his own age, and by extension, I think all ages, that's the point about prophecy, is it can be kind of applicable, not just, you know, it's not just the urgency of your own moment, but it has a kind of broader trans historical applic uh, applicability. Um, because it reveals a greater mythic reality, uh, of which Duncan believed everything was a part. Right? So if there is this sense of pattern informing his reading. And it also informs um, his poetic response to Vietnam. So this is how he comes to write poetry, which I think can be considered a form of protest poetry, but not the kind of poem, as he put it, that makes a point. Because it starts to enact, it makes great use of the poetic field, the dramatis personae, the way in which um, a drama can unfold in a poem. Um, and the way in which uh, poetry can give us that texture, that mythic texture of correspondence that was real for Duncan. Describing the way in which his poems responded to American aggression, he declared, in a blast, the poem announces the satanic perso person of a president whose lives and, uh, lies and connivings have manoeuvred the nation into a pit, the pit of an evil war. What does it mean? It is a mere political event of the day, and yet it comes revealed as an eternal sentence. OK, so here you can see the, ten the tension right, that I've been trying to unpack and explain, the mere political event of the day, the thing that is happening now, the thing that matters now, the thing that will pass, the thing that will go and there will be another one. And yet it comes revealed as an eternal sentence. Nothing transitory is really transitory. Everything is in some way performing, acting out a mythic, uh, prophetic reality. And Duncan found hope as well as horror in Blake as a guide here. Reminding his readers, and I quote again, in England, the divine break 
broke through the confines of 17th and 18th century rational poetics with his marriage of heaven and hell, blasting that model of self-righteous and reasonable man, the deist, and howling against the first factories and machineries. Okay, so like many of his contemporaries, Duncan is imagining and crafting and shaping a Blake here who is a champion of imagination over reason. Um, but there is something, I think, a little bit more intelligent, I suppose, than that in his reception here, uh, when he says blasting that model of self-righteous and reasonable man, the, the, the deist, that he sees that it's not just reason, uh, or perhaps, you know, that, that um, and it's in fact not reason, that Blake is necessarily getting at its self-righteousness. And, and that, you know, I think we can see something of, of the, the quality of his response here, which um, otherwise in some ways might just be a, a quite a generic and, and lazy one, really, uh, of, of Blake as a kind of um, rebellious figure. Uh, and, and the other thing I think that, that that jumps out to me, perhaps in this quotation, um, is that word howling, uh, familiar to readers of Ginsberg, um, of course, uh, from his, his great poem, Howl. And it was Blake that inspired the title of Howl. It was the, the long poem, The French Revolution and the Governor's Howlings that inspired that title. And I think Duncan knows what he's doing here. Uh, in when he, you know, when he says howling against the first factories and machineries, he's not only echoing Blake, he's echoing Ginsburg, echoing Blake. Again, there is a sense of lineage. There is a very, you know, there is a very strong sense of the kind of tradition of poetic and prophetic bards that Duncan wants to be part of here. Um, and I think Duncan realised uh, that Blake was a difficult and an ethical writer. After reading Blake's visions of the Daughters of Albion, he reportedly composed his great poem of national and poetic, uh, personal identity. Um, the poem is called My Mother Would Be a Falconer. So it's extremely long. I do recommend it. Um, I'd have to uh, quote selectively from it on my PowerPoint. I, I usually, when I talk about poems, like to give people the whole thing, but that was pretty much you know, it, it, would have, it would have taken up rather too much space. Um, so I've quoted from it here and quoted from the preface uh, to it here. Um, and he explained um, how he composed this in, and he published this explanation, He uh, how he composed this in a, a semi-automatic state, right, this poem, after reading Blake's visions. And quoting from Uthun's Lament in the poem, um, he explained how reading Blake jolted him out of a state of complacency and forced him to acknowledge the violence which he, of which he, like everyone else, was capable. So it forced him into a kind of acknowledgement of complicity, of what it means to be complicit with violence, even when one isn't necessarily enacting it. Um, and the result was an extraordinary poem, really, which hinges on the border crossings between poetic law Politi political action and personal narrative. And so he said, uh, and I, I want to read this out, um, and searching out the poetic law of what America is. Uh, so again, I think we have this sense of a reception in America, which is very much about um, a literary self-fashioning of America's, of what America is, a, a self-image. I had been reading Blake's Visions of the Daughters of Albion these last few nights, just before going to sleep. With what sense is it that the chicken shuns the ravenous hawk I had read? And I said to myself, yes, there are bloody men, and I am not one of them, but of chicken kind, for I would never draw blood. Which goes to show one should be careful of vain delusions entertained at bedtime. For now my dream would have me a hawk. And hearing my account, Jess, that's his partner, comments, especially since chickens do draw blood, Whereupon I recall those horrible cannibalistic hens I tended at Treesbank that needed only the first sign of blood that they might be le that might be left after egg laying to tear at each other, bloody not from hunger but from malice, like so many poets furious in their pecking order. Do I draw blood then, chicken wise, and hide myself in hawk's disguise? 
the complicity with violence which we see here, right, this sense of actually, you know, I think I am innocent, but I am the more, you know, as violent as any, um, was something which he derived uh, from Blake's visions. Um, Blake, the, the poem uh, Visions of the Daughters of Albion inspired a coming of age story for Duncan, when mirroring Uthun's cry um, against political, sec uh, sexual, um, mental subjugation, Duncan's poet Falcon turned on his falconress to assert the individually and individuality and freedom of his voice and sexual identity. So the poem begins, my mother would be a falconess and I, her gay falcon treading her wrist, would fly back to bring back from the blue sky to her, bleeding a prize. The trajectory of flight that we see here, which is carried by the elevating rhymes of I, fly, sky, and the alliterative descent of bring black, uh, blue, is circumscribed and defined by the trained murder, which foreshadows a violent re rebellion in the poem, in which the poet falcon's obedient yet restless treading later would draw blood. The image of a bleeding prize echoes Uthun's summoning of Theotorman's eagle in, in visions to rend her flesh, right? I call with holy voice, kings of the sounding air, uh, rend away this defiled bosom that I may reflect the image of Theotorman on my pure, transparent breast. Like Uthu, this, his cry for freedom, Duncan's cry for freedom, elides the difference between murder and, well, I think rape, um, but where Uthun calls for Theotorman's eagle to rend her own body, the poet falcon longs to inflict that violence on others. When will she let me bring down the little birds, pierced from their flight with their necks broken, their heads like flowers, limp from the stem? Like Uthun, the poet Falcon is both the victim of an oppression and the perpetrator of rebellious violence. Like Uthun, his self-empowerment substitutes that violence for the frustrations of an unfulfilled sexual desire. And so the falcon recalls, the poet falcon, Duncan's, recalls the Atorman's eagle and the eagle of America. And, and I've got here the image uh, from Visions on, on the bottom of my screen, an incredibly provocative image that Brake gives us of a golden eagle, surely recalling the symbol of America, as well as um, the Atorman's eagle uh, penetrating this vision, this image of a woman, um, who is laid out in a posture of sexual invitation. Uh, the beak is also going pretty much into her abdomen as if to enact a kind of abortion, a violent rewriting, undoing of the rape that she suffered at the hands of Bromian. Um, and uh, also uh, kind of echoing the image of Prometheus having his, his liver plucked out, right? So that kind of Christological, sacrificial, classical image. Um, an incredibly powerful one, I think, and one that inspired in Duncan an equally layered and complex imagination of uh, violence and rebellion. Um, the, so so the, the falcon, the poet falcon, recalls this eagle and the eagle of America, just as the little birds um, that he brings back uh, with their heads like flowers limp from the stem, recall Uthun's soft soul, which those of you who know the poem well will remember that it is stamped out within the first five lines of uh, Visions of the Daughters of Albion when she is brutally raped by the slaveholder Bromian. Um, and her budding promise, um, which represents to some extent in some way the, the budding promise of America um, is quickly and violently undermined. She's wandering, um, she's soft, she's full of sexual promise, she's full of youthfulness, um, and it is quickly stamped out, it is quickly, quickly uh, destroyed. Um, so uh, 
this represents, I think, both the poet and the larger national poem with which the poet is complicit. Um, Duncan therefore consciously inherits Blake's mode of complex ethical observation, thinking about the way in which such penetrative violence might take on a very particular mythological significance in the context of contemporary America, and in particular, um, the context of the American, of the, uh, a slip there, of the Vietnam War. Um, thus, the poet Falcon's bid for freedom provides a rather pointed reflection on America's actions in Vietnam. As Duncan says, as Duncan Speaker says, it seemed my human soul went down in flames. And it's hard not to see the image of um, uh, crashing planes uh, that were so, uh, you know, that, 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 that are so associated with um, uh, and, and firebombing from above that is so f associated with Vietnam. The monstrous strait of America is reflected in the monstrosity of frustrated desire and poetic ambition, striking out from the blood to be free. Like Blake, Duncan did not absolve himself or anyone from complicity with violence. His agonised personal narrative meshed with uh, his mythopoeic vision of a corrupt America, whose aggressive foreign policy pursuing freedom at all costs was indicative of a deep spiritual sickness. His reading of uh, Blake's America, a prophecy, like his reading of Visions of the Daughters of Albion, picked up on Blake's identification of in, uh, internal and external sexual and political forms of oppression and release. Representing the birth of America, uh, the birth of an independent United States, as a confused reality of frustrated desire and corrupted ambition, rather than uh, what it was commonly mythologized as, which was an ideal projection of freedom and possibility. So in other words, um, Duncan realized that Blake saw the writing on the wall, right? That he'd seen, you know, he'd seen those ironies um, of uh, uh, Americans self-image as a new Eden, of uh, a land of freedom and possibility from the start. And Blake realized that and his reception took full account of that. Um, he explained, Blake, looking into the beginning of the American Revolution, saw the revolution of the states as belonging to the drama of the deep sickness of Europe where the horrible darkness is impressed with the reflections of desire. OK, so he's recognising here the importance of France um, and the French Revolution in uh, Blake's representations of America, in his, his great American works. Blake's vision of is of a confusion of intense and power that strikes true to the confusion in which America was born. At first, seeing Washington, Franklin, Plain as heroes rising in the flames of unfulfilled desire, rising to liberate man from his bonds of repression, Blake came in his lifetime to see Washington as he saw Napoleon, as a heroic villain for following the, subsid the subsidence of the American and French Revolution came no liberation of man's nature from the external repressions of social law or the internal repressions of the superego, as we would call it. The reality of our history appeared in flames and agony, whereas spiritual agony was at work to unite in marriage, heaven and hell, or the righteous and the damned. Okay. Um, so in other words, the fiery apocalypse that Duncan had been taught to expect from childhood and saw prophesied in Blake seemed to be beginning for him again in contemporary America. Duncan described the war in Vietnam as evidence of this latter day decline. He wrote, we enter again into the last days of our own history for everywhere living productive forms in the evolution of forms fail, weaken or grow monstrous, destroying the terms of their existence. Cities laid waste, villages destroyed, men, women and children hunted down in their fields, Forests poisoned, herds of elephants screaming. When in moments of vision, 
I see the back of the photograph details and the dead daily body counts and actual bodies in agony and here what I hear now is the desolate bellowing of some ox in a ditch. Madness starts up in me. The pulse of this sentence beats beyond all beats before all proper bounds, and we no longer inhabit what we thought properly our own. Okay. So if this passage, I think I think it's quite a dense passage, but a, a fascinating one really with what it does with the texture of experience uh, and poetry, if this passage is a description of contemporary uh, democracy in America, which had compromised itself to Duncan's mind by its aggressive actions in Vietnam. It is also a psychological exploration of this condition at an individual level. Our defense, he says, has invaded an area of selves that troubled us, right? So you can see the influence there of psychoanalysis of the idea of uh, everything that we do externally actually being a, a sort of, um, uh, also something which is happening internally. And it's also a meditation on the poetics of experience. The pulse of this sentence beats beyond all proper bounds. And I think we have a sense here of what Duncan means by the grotesque, right, of why he thinks that American democracy, that its usage of the word freedom is properly grotesque because it has, it is uncontainable. Um, it won't contain itself within proper bounds. It doesn't inhabit uh, what it should inhabit. Um, and that is, I think, a feature of mm. the grotesque um, in its original kind of artistic mode. It was grottoesque. It was something which held together things which didn't go together. That's why grotesques often have their tongues sticking out. They are bloated. They are spilling over the bounds of their own bodies. Um, it is a, a feeling of something which has grown overwhelmingly excessive and in doing so has become internally corrupt, emptied out, hollowed, uh, you know, failed spiritually. Uh, so I think he brings here a real sense of the literary and artistic grotesque um, of what that means in terms of a poetic field uh, to inform, to understand, to act out, to dramatise his sense of the grotesque nature of American democracy. Um, he claimed Blake and Burma with their revelation of what a time of wrath means, give a key to the vision one must have, right? So he comes in here with Blake as a kind of corrective, uh, not only enacting this grotesque, but also, I think, giving a sense of hope. Right? So that this is, I think, the um, the quality of Duncan's reception is that he sees a Blake of vision and terror, but he also sees a Blake of hope. Um, and in his poem Uprising, uh, Duncan's poem Uprising, Blake's America, uh, a prophecy, offered a way of reflecting on the monstrous violence that Duncan saw in Vietnam. He compared the mania, the ravening eagle of America to Blake's vision of America in figures of fire and blood raging. And that's where I took the uh, quotation for my you know, title quotation for my talk, um, because I think it's this figurative imagination, as it were, that becomes so inspirational to him. But he followed this with a question. In what image? Blake's vision of fiery uprising represented both the hope and the terror of revolutionary spirit. Um, for Duncan, the violence and horror was an America grown so fat on its own despotic idea of democracy that its ravening eagle knew no bounds and could not satiate its insane hunger for human flesh. And that's what he dramatizes happening in Vietnam. Blake's figures prophesied for Duncan the terrible history of American violence, but they also reflected a mythopoeic imagination that Duncan felt embraced alterity that preserved individual freedoms um, in the face of dominance 
and subjugation. But I think what's interesting, uh, really interesting to me about Duncan's reception of Blake is that he recognises this tension between writing from myth and political action. Uh, in what image? You know, perhaps the image will, will, will fail us. Um, and it reminds me of an early version of the preludium to Blake's America, where Loss is wandering through the vales of Kent and he dashes his heart. Um, he gives up. It's like, I can't do this. I can't. I, the prophet is is useless at this point. Um, politics is more powerful. And I think that that, you know, that is uh, the haunting fear, really, for Duncan, as I think it was the haunting fear for Blake, um, that perhaps uh, perhaps the image won't be enough. Perhaps the, the prophet artist will fail, really, in, in their responsible task. Um, so for Duncan, the purpose of poetry became not to incite readers to action, but to draw attention to the poem as an imaginative field in which which played out an action that was already happening. Um, Duncan turned to Blake again, he keeps turning to Blake to explain his vision. He said Blake saw the war within clearly. He saw a figure that we are today involved in, the freedom that the integration of man demanded. He saw America as the working ground for all mankind. And I think there's a sort of truth in that. I think that America did retain that kind of symbolism for Blake as an arena in which he could rehearse things. Um, the, it did function as a sort of working ground for him. There could be no easy victory, he said. And this is key. Tolerance could be no substitute for love. Only in the love feast of the agape and the love wedding in which desire was liberated in sensual delight would the work be done. In the light of a doctrine of the meaning of wrath read out of Jacob Burma and a doctrine of unacted desire and sensual grace read out of Blake, I saw the wrath and dreams of America in Vietnam as an appearance of the hydra of a thousand vengeful heads rising in the vision of man, the violence of a deeply violated nature in all the places of order. Okay, um, again, I think a, an extremely dense passage, which I probably, I, I, I'm checking the time here, have limited time to unpack, um, but I am happy to unpack a bit more. But I think the important thing to pick out of this is there will be no easy victory. And that Duncan um, locates uh, redemption in the love feast of the agape, uh, sensual desire and de uh, uh, sensual delight and desire, and that this involves risk. That there is no love without risk. There is no desire without risk, um, and that is what is dramatised uh, in in visions of the daughters of Albion, uh, among other things. Is 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 that that feeling of risk? Um, and in his copybook, Duncan transcribed Uthun's lament for the lost moment of desire uh, in a section entitled The Matter of America. If America had promise for Duncan, it was only to be realised through a kind of in intimacy, um, a, a feeling of, of desire, of sexual fulfilment, which he, he felt he shared with Blake. Contemporary democracy, with its troubling exclusion of this, um, and a perceived tendency towards individual stultification and sexual repression uh, was seemed monstrous by comparison. So it was in the affectionate restoration of democracy and community realised in the poetic field with a large degree of risk, I think, that Duncan found hope for society. Um, and so his reading of Blake, I think, exposed um, the scope, but also the limitations of the mythopoeic imagination in its ongoing search for America and the particular role that Blake came to shape, uh, play in this mythopoeic imagination and American literary um, self-image. But I want to end just with one more qualification uh, because while Duncan learned much from Blake, um, he created works uh, which, which I've given a flavour of, but which look very different to Blake. Unlike many others of his generation who returned to that mantra of cleansed perception, Duncan wanted something murkier. 
something more qualified, something more rooted in human in intimacy. And he saw this as a great point of divergence between himself and Blake, claiming I am very different from Blake in my poetry, absolutely the antithesis of Blake who wants it light. I love Rembrandt with his dark, deep study of the dark. So despite his occultist upbringing and its emphasis on revelation, Duncan's responses to Blake set complicity with violence and the ethics of alterity and human sexuality above the promise of divine revelation and pellucid perception, which was sort of what everyone was talking about. And in this respect, and I am going to end here, um, I think Duncan achieved something critical um, in and, and something, you know, I think texturally fascinating in both the modernization and the Americanization of Blake's thought. <laughs>